Can you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Okay. So, okay, like, okay, one long talk, right? Um, then let's check it out. Okay, uh, I have some stickers here. Um, more stickers. Um, I'll, I'll have some. I, I, okay. Okay, I'll leave it for, for the rest of the guys. Okay, so uh, questions. Okay, uh, this is not a sticker question. <laughs> Who who is in the the, the data side of data? I mean engineering, like any data engineers, like any any C two and and um, data scientists, sort of right? Data engineer, data scientists, you have more or less the same thing, right? <laughs> the data scientist. <laughs> I mean, you have yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. So, so, uh, so when when I speak about data engineers, I, I also include uh, data uh, data ops. So that that's like a sub branch of DevOps that that just does data stuff. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, right. So, one sticker question. Um, <laughs> who can, can anyone tell me what is um, Kubeflow. Okay. Um, Kubeflow will be uh, sorry, Kubeflow serving uh, as well as um, training on, on Kubernetes. Yes, that's right. Kind of. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'll just pass it down. So, so, um, so two thousand and nineteen is gonna be. The, a prediction will be that uh, it will be the time when uh, there will be a large uh, uptake from the AI side, the machine learning side on Kubernetes because we, we are facing a lot of problems with infrastructure and deploying apps. So to answer your question what Kubeflow is, uh, Kubeflow is actually the combination of Kubernetes and TensorFlow, right? So uh, it's basically a framework for doing machine learning in the cloud. So, but, but we are not, uh, Kubeflow is pretty new, it's at point 0.4, I think point 0.4 just released. So what I'm talking about today are basically the basic components of Kubeflow. So Kubeflow, you can think of it as a massive Helm chart with many sub-Helm charts. So, so, so that's basically what Kubeflow is. And actually, Kubeflow is not using Helm, it's actually using KSONet. Okay, so um, some information about me, I'm, I'm data scientist at Honestly, and before that I was doing computational biology in the domain of genomics. So, any researchers here? No? Okay. <laughs> Shit. Okay, so, so this is the setup I had when I was doing my, my postgraduate, right? So, um, we had a simple SGE cluster, so there's a hate note for submission of jobs, and uh, basically you, you write scripts and they send it into the cluster to do work, and it's usually a shared uh, resource, and you have queues, and Basically, um, a huge ass, um, um, what do you call that? A nest to do a data storage. So, this is very different from um, me going into Honestly. So, I, I don't have that type of resource at my disposal. In, in fact, the, the, uh, this, this is like my home setup, right? Uh, just simple desktop. And I, at work, I was actually just, give, I was given actually something even worse. <laughs> I was even like a very low powered uh, laptop to, to do machine learning. I, I was thinking, how am I going to do this? <laughs> right? One pair of Titans? Yeah, yeah, no, this is my home one. One pair of Titans? Yeah, one pair of Titans. Uh, how many cores is that? Uh, that's the i9. So, right. so. 10, 10 cores or 12? Um, the 10 core one. I think it costs a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, Nvidia actually sponsored the, the Titans. Because uh, you, you can actually apply for it for a, from the, using an academic license, and actually only one of it belongs to me. Uh, the the other Titan actually belongs to another uh, researcher, and we just shared them. We, it, basically, I'm sharing this desktop. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So right. So how how do I get from from this back to something like this, right? Um, okay. So so like. Okay, so when I, when I came in, uh, I sort of knew that Kubernetes is going to be the solution because I, I have like seniors that are in other companies that are using this. 
uh, specifically uh, like uh, people from human longevity. Uh, not sure if anybody has heard of them, uh, but, but that's how they do their training. So, so uh, this actually I can't. This is Tommy here. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so he's like the evangelist, right, for for Kubernetes and honestly. So he's like telling everyone, okay, please use it. So, so that's how I got to know about that. Okay. So, so similarly, uh, like in the picture of the SGE cluster, you have nodes, right? So instead of compute nodes, these nodes do different things. They they more or less serve web applications and maybe run some databases. But for, from the data scientist point of view, we need to crunch numbers, we need to do computes. So so I'm using I'm looking at this as a compute resource. Okay, so like I knew nothing about Kubernetes, so so I basically uh, went with Tommy for the KubeCon at Shanghai. <laughs> that, that that was a pretty interesting uh, uh, affair, and I was actually pleasantly surprised that there's actually a whole track just for ML and data. So, so I was actually I was actually shocked that there is a whole track. So you, you can see for for two days, it's back to back talks of using um, Kubernetes for machine learning. So most of these is basically talking about how 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 to actually bring uh, from a, lab, a desktop to production, right? So so this this slide keeps coming up. Right, no matter where I went, uh, whichever talk that happened, and I, I see more of the, the machine learning talks happening. Okay, so uh, so this this paper is actually the, the hidden technical depth in machine learning. So so many many people think that okay, uh, as a data scientist, I just have to write training code, but but really I have to do this whole set of things. Okay, and and it's it's crazy amount of stuff and. <laughs> And, and the yellow dot is just that. So this was actually an animation. So it is like it will be this, and then many other things come up. <coughs> and this is what I want to do, right? I want to be doing machine learning. I want to train. I want to run, and I get the data and I come back. So this is pretty standard, right? So credit is to York, uh, not not honestly York, but <laughs> that there was another speaker which did the slide. So I basically pillaged it. Okay. So um, right. So. We, we, we would do this, but there's also this other side that is, is a huge problem, which is that inference time. How do you deploy this? Uh, so this comes back to like this this image, right? Uh, so there, there's a lot of, uh, we need a lot of DevOps help here. right? But we also need Kubernetes here as well to train. Okay, so um, in, in the, I'm sharing with you what I've learned from KubeCon. So, so basically, that same image now is has been one of the speakers actually broke this up into the three roles, right? So you have the data scientist, you have the data engineer, and the data ops. So this is slightly different from DevOps. This guy basically has to understand enough data science to bring it into production, and and that's actually DevOps, right? So ML and uh, we are supposed to be okay according to the speaker that uh, basically you are again. Uh, speech extraction analysis and a bit of model monitoring is basically what data scientists should be focusing on. And the data ops are basically helping us with uh, process management tools, monitoring, data uh, verification and collection, and then uh, there's the sysadmins which are doing like the overall cluster maintenance. So you have configuration and basically resource management. And there's also this huge chunk which is serving. Right? So you can see how Kubernetes is like everywhere in this chart. And, and you will see that Calm actually sits here. So besides the division of labor, uh, so you, there, there comes this new term called data ops. Like you can call it like AI ops or something like that. I don't, I'm not sure. Whatever name you want to call it. Some, right? So this guy basically needs to know these two things. Okay? If, if you have worked long enough as data scientists, you will also pick up some of this. And, and the, the, whoever that pairs with you will pick up on the data science. Okay, so so I'll share with you. Uh, so Kubeflow, right from the very beginning when I mentioned, is actually a framework to try to cover this whole piece, like each component. So uh, it's I, I would not recommend that you use this in in uh, Kubeflow in uh, production yet, but we, we can take inspiration from its individual parts. So I'll start with the first, which is actually uh, Jupyter Hub, right? So who here knows what are notebooks? 
Okay, so everybody's familiar with notebooks. Okay, there's, there's different types of notebooks. There's Zeppelin notebooks, there's Jupyter notebooks. Uh, basically, I think everybody just loves Jupyter notebooks and nobody really likes Zeppelin notebooks. But <laughs> Yeah, so so uh, we, we have to get, but the, the thing with Jupyter Notebook is that it's, uh, it's not really s supported by most of the uh, paid for solutions. You, you have to run it on your own. And, and this is basically how uh, I, we came up with this, right? So, um, so Jupyter Hub came, when, when Jupyter Hub was first conceived, it's supposed to be running on just a single server, but now there's this new um, uh, Helm chart is called uh, Kubernetes Jupyter. So, so basically, it's just Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes cluster, right? So, uh, the Kubernetes, so when you have installed this chart, right, uh, if you list the ports, you'll get basically a hard port and a proxy port, and each uh, each user will get its own container that's running uh, its own Jupyter notebook. And there's something called a cube spawner. So you can actually specify the image. Say, I, I honestly, we have two teams in data science, right? We have an e-commerce team and we have a logistic team. So you will imagine the types of software that we are using are very different. We, we can have a base image for data science, but but each the logistic team will be using something entirely different from what I'm using, right? So maybe some uh, something like Cplex, but I, I know that's not <laughs> Linux, but something similar. Right, and we can actually store this in a registry, and you can pull this, and then uh, you can spin up the containers. So the, the good thing here is that it, uh, this lets you customize your data science image. Right, who plays Kaggle here? No. Okay, solve. Right. So if, if you have been using Kaggle recently, you, you see that actually their 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 kernels are getting more uh, interesting. You can actually load saved images as well. So I, I'm guessing this actually runs on top of. Something or something that's like cube spawner. So so basically, when the, the port is spun up, uh, there's a persistent volume, uh, so that if it dies, at least my data will survive, right? <laughs> and and this is linked up to this. Uh, so this is the base image, and then I'm I'm happily here doing all my data science stuff, and I don't have to care about the, the server anymore, right? So having a, a very good base image is important because not everything can be done in the notebook. You might need to access, I mean not access actually, you need, you, nowadays you, you pop forward into the, 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 the container, right? You use Catty. So you, you will just go inside the container. So you, you will treat it like, like a base, really a, you will install all the software there, right? And, and this, this will also help you, this base image will help you like get to a working state in the same day you join the company, right? It used to be like you take maybe a week to set up your environment, but once you have a base image, one hour, that's all you need. Okay, so, uh, right. Okay. So something which I, I did not mention much is that there are GPU images. So um, this only runs on Ubuntu, so it, it, if you have a Mac, these images will not work. So in the Qt spawner, you can actually uh, specify a GPU resource. So you can say, I, on the machine where I have two Titans, I can actually have two users spun up, right? Uh, so so that, that's the beauty of the thing. All right, so, so here's like a step-by-step, -step. you pop forward to the proxy, and then you'll be greeted with like a login screen. You will sign up, basically, and then uh, here is like uh, spawner options. You, you can fully customize this. This will go into the Helm chart basically when it's being deployed. So you can specify the image and then uh, maybe how many CPU, what's the memory constraints and the GPU constraints. And then you can start uh, your Jupyter notebook. Uh, here, uh, Jupyter, the new versions of Jupyter Lab actually has both, uh, Jupyter Hub has both Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook. So if you want to switch, you just need to change the URL, right? Okay, so we'll move on for analysis. Okay, so we spend, as data scientists, we spend a lot of time here, and then there's actually some time that is spent here. Actually, a lot of time is spent here. Uh, right, so feature extraction. So we have to do some scrubbing of the data, bring it out, like, like Athena, or, or maybe like uh, Spark is our best friend, right? Uh, Okay, so so once you've got 
uh, this feature extraction, you want to like do some ETL transformation, I think. and that takes time, right? And, and you need to repeat this. It needs to be reproducible science, right? So what's the best way to reproduce this? You need to write some sort of uh, execution plan, right? You do the, the extraction, you do the transformation, and then you do the load. So that, this is this is very old stuff that's been done before, right? There's nine from really long ago, and I, even in the SGE clusters, you have the ability to link jobs together. So if one job's finished, you're done. And then when, when uh, there's also something like Airflow. So who heard about Airflow? I'll give the sticker. <laughs> okay, okay, pass it. Okay. So so how how what what do we use Airflow for mostly? Okay, two more stickers. Yeah, I'm going here. Quick, you have to put your hands up. <laughs> Quick, one. <laughs> okay. So, use Airflow for automatically running the jobs. Yeah, yeah. Scheduling the jobs. Awesome. Say again? Scheduling the jobs. Yes, yeah, scheduling the jobs, right? So these are like big ass cron jobs, right? That you need to repeat over and over and over again. But but when we are when we are doing okay, feature extraction, yes, you are, you, you might want to do this over and over again if you're retraining the model. But there's something else which is hyperparameter search. So if you've got a lot of like parameters that you need to check through, is Airflow the best tool that you have? Not really, right? Um, and, and only recently did Airflow have support for Kubernetes, right? So only in the new, newest release in 1.10 was there port operators. So before that, there was only Docker operators, right? So the only option before that to run Airflow in a in a, in a multi-node machine, I guess mostly on Mesos Marathon. <laughs> no, no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so so like okay, I'm I'm focusing here on like the hyperparameter search part, right? So you have a standard DAG. Okay, you got feature extraction, you got feature processing, and then you've got training, right? And, and you want to try different parameters here. So your DAG changes, and this this space that you're going to be exploring. The combinations that you'll be exploring will be very huge, right? You can do a random search, but it will still be huge. You can do train, and then you have to do the evaluation. So each step can be containerized, right? This this helps with the DevOps as well because they they don't want to know how your data science algorithm works, <laughs> right? And, and the data scientists are not the best. We are not trained usually as uh, engineers. We are trained to get the job done. So our code base is not really the, the best, right? So so once you containerize, it's a black box, right? It really truly becomes an ML black box to further the stereotype, but this is how it works. Okay? So, uh, so I'll talk more about job submission now. So like in, in the SGE cluster, you do something like this, right? You can write a very long ass um, batch script to do the submission, but this is as, as, as light as it goes. You do you queue up, you specify the amount of calls, you give it uh, some variables and then you execute the script, right? Uh, I did not include here is that then there will be positional arguments that you can pass, right? So routinely I would do like five thousand jobs when I was doing my PhD, like easily. Then I'll go, on, I'll usually submit it on Friday and I'll come back on Monday and be done, <laughs> right? Hopefully nothing goes wrong, right? But but it's it's pretty smooth. This is a very stable structure. Right? And, and you can, if, if anything does go bad, you can, you can actually check on the status of the job. What happened, like how did it feel, and things like that. So, so how am I going to replicate this in a, in a Kubernetes environment, right? So, so, so I was desperately searching and then I, I found Kubeflow. But when, when I tried, I mean, so I was very excited. I, when, when I went to Kubeflow, the, the founder actually said that please don't use it for production yet because the founder himself feels that it's not ready for production, right? But but the, the Kubeflow has this component called Kubeflow Pipelines, and it, it, it was just released, but before that they were actually using Argo, and in fact, Kubeflow Pipeline was based on Argo. It's still based on Argo. So Argo is a workflow management. Uh, I think you can use it for uh, CI, CD as well. So there's GitOps, right? If you want to do GitOps, this is like the perfect thing, right? 
So, so like I said, workflow is just one component. There's actually uh, four different components to it. But I will just be talking about the workflow. So, like uh, Alex mentioned on CRD, so uh, Argo also has a customized uh, resource uh, definition, right? So, so it's a workflow definition. So, so when you install Argo, you will have basically two pods running, and that will be the UI pod. So, there's actually a very pretty user interface. Um, better than that, too. <laughs> and, and there's a workflow controller. So this is basically managing all the workflows that you'll be giving it. Okay. So so like 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 queues up, you will have Argo submit. So your Argo is actually a wrapper around cube um, control. So cube cutter, cube whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so so I I I I will still follow cube control. <laughs> That's why I'm on YouTube. So, so um, you, you have the name. So you have to define the name, right? And and basically here there will be a job ID that's attached to that, right? So you can try different parameters. They will all have a different uh, job ID, but the, the the prefix will remain the same, right? And and you can actually pass it arguments, right? So you can submit these jobs as though I was submitting a script. Okay, I'll show you how to do it later. Okay, and once the script is done, you can it, uh, you can actually get details about it using Argo Get, and you can actually look and visit the outputs of these jobs using Argo Logs, right? So this this is really really useful. Um, okay, so this is basically how a definition of a Argo workflow is. So um, you you can actually write templates. So in, in case you have nested. Uh, 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 what do you call that? Nested workflows when we use certain components, uh, and you see here there's actually a, a container image. So you have to build the image. So, so previously when uh, you can just uh, submit a script into your SG cluster, now you have to put the script inside the container, right? The image, sorry. And then you run the image with uh, entry point, and then you have arguments. Here the arguments can be actually variable. So you just have to define define this with a, a template and Basically, you can run these templates with different values, right? These can be the, the values can be written into the flow, or it can be given to Argo at runtime. So so you can like just Argo submit minus p for parameter, and then give it the, the the argument name and the value basically. So so here, actually, I I, I didn't know that there was no uh, videos allowed in the videos, <laughs> or rather the presentations. So I actually did a screenshot of how it works. But uh, this is basically how, how the, the DAG looks like. So you start with the DAG name and the first step, and these two actually carry out in parallel. So you can actually spin two containers in this workflow. Right? So how you do this is actually have a master structure. Uh, so you have a sequential one. So this happens first, and these two happens uh, sequentially. So you can do this for any type of jobs that you want to do. Right. Uh, okay. Coming to the last part. So I'm not. I'm not going to go through all parts of this. But but personally, when I first transitioned to honestly from in the from academia to industry, the worst component was actually serving. And like Vincent said, I need a lot of support from from the outside to get my machine learning models up. Okay. And it's like a double whammy. Like okay, there's a lot of support that I needed, and there's not enough manpower. And um, basically, I was at the mercy of all the devops. Right. So, uh, but but going forward, I, I think all developers, not just DevOps, should know how to write their own Helm charts. Right. So with Helm tree, um, if 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 the dream is true, you can start writing in a scripting language. It will be less, uh, it will be easier to sum up, right? Because lots of YAML files don't look very nice. So so, but I, I, I the the scripting language will be in Lua. So they actually announced it at KubeCon. I was like, what Lua? <laughs> So so, but but the the the, the person who said uh, who, who announced this says that there's no stopping um, open source from building something like a Python scripting layer over this. It's just that uh, Lua was chosen because it has a good integration with Go. <laughs> okay, so I, I like this chart, uh, this picture because um, like okay, so this is the typical flow of a data scientist, right? So you have algorithm design. Okay, maybe if you are just pillaging from an existing paper, you don't have to really do this. Um, then you have exploration, proof of concept, and then you do some small data to validate this, and then you validate this in production. 
but maybe this will, this will be a small set and this will be a big set. Right? And then here it says, promise your DBA you will write select and no install update. Right? So you need to basically ask for a lot of permissions to do all this stuff, right? Because you, you, you need to draw data and not everyone is very willing to uh, provide you with this. I, I know people have been stuck in this cycle for a long time. Especially the bigger the company you get, the, the more time you get stuck here. And, and uh, you have to integrate with uh, staging and then you have to prove that it works. I'm not sure how you prove your machine learning algorithm works in staging. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, then you have, um, uh, right, then you have to go through QA, right, provided QA understands your data science. <laughs> and then finally you go into production, right, and, and here be dragons in between, right, <laughs> and then finally you have money, hopefully prove that your algorithm works and you belong in the company, <laughs> right, else it's all flat. Okay, so, so this, the infrastructure for serving these these microservices will be managed by DevOps, but really, the, we need to pick up. The, I mean, we need to pick up the slack as developers to write our own help charts, right? And and um, whether there will be a repository is another question to be said. Because if you are deploying a lot of microservices, uh, going through. I, personally, I don't feel the need for a CI/CD as long as the chart is installed. Uh, it's working. I don't want to see that again, but different ideas. So that, that's one, uh, like, a, that's a main, like, that's, a, that's actually a back end for data, and it, the, the, the back end for data will actually call off of my models. Okay, right? so uh, data scientists, we have to do the helm, and then um, this is basically how we connect. The helm charts we need to connect with the feature part, and I basically drew, like, that's a duo, right? So we need two people to party. Right, the data scientist cannot do this alone. Okay, maybe the data scientist is this one and the data ops is this one. <laughs> right? We, we change rules. Okay? So it's, this is what I've gone through so far. There's another component here which is in uh, model monitoring. So so I'm, I'm using a lot of these traditional monitoring tools like Datadog and Grafana. Hopefully Grafana, <laughs> not 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 Grafana yet. But to to not only map we uh, we, we uh, normally these are used to measure like CPU usage, memory usage, you know connections. But I'm using this to look at um, more business metrics like a dashboard, which is live, right, and stream data. Okay. So while doing this, I. I learned that Alpine is not my best friend. Uh, as long as don't link to the C library. Yeah. So so I I found out that it's not good at uh, resolving the DNS. So I spent a lot of time building like a deployment image, but, but I found that it's not the best thing. And then uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So uh, yeah, extra slides. Actually, I'm working on the recommendation systems. Uh, so, so this is this is a bit off topic. So basically, um, you have products and then um, collaborative models which are run on like uh, batch. So these will be your workflows, and then there will be ranking, right? So you basically generate a series of uh, recommended products, and this is where the microservices will have to do the processing live, right? Based on the the features that come in live. So this was sit in the community structure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So do you use TensorFlow serving and microservices? Of course. Uh, yes, using gRPC. So, uh, so you um, okay? So in in the Helm charts, there is the liveliness probe and the uh, what's the other one? The readiness probe, right? So, so the the TensorFlow serving doesn't have a REST endpoint to check that. So you have to use the gRPC TCP to check whether it's alive. So, uh, but but it cannot serve the the model directly because the input needs to be transformed first. So it's usually a pair. 
So you have one flask and a TensorFlow serving. So the, the amazing thing that I found was that actually TensorFlow serving, I, I did not have to scale the pods. It's actually really fast. Uh, but uh, that, 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 okay, so back to this chart, right? So in Kubeflow, uh, the solution for serving is actually one more layer sitting up, uh, on top of Helm charts. It's actually something called Seldon. So um, the, the input is kind of okay. similar to TensorFlow serving. So, yeah. Uh, is ser TensorFlow serving, is that K-native serving, like serverless functions? Uh, no. It has to be running, yes. Right. Then that's actually, uh, GKE has something which is kind of serverless as well. So you, you can upload your, your models directly. Yeah. Does, does that answer your question? Oh, I was just wondering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said serving, I just thought it was KNA to serve. Ah, okay. It's a different animal. Yeah. But, but the thing with um, uh, TensorFlow serving was that if you have big uh, models that have a lot of weights that needs to be initialized into memory, you need, like, I think Bian Kuhn suggested, like, a sidecar to hit it first to warm it up. I was the first user that uses that. I, 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 I will often encounter this because I'm, I'm testing it out. So the first user will fail because it's still warming up with all the weights. So, so that, that's, the, that's one problem with TensorFlow serving. Cool. Thank you, Wesley. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.